Eh, bueno, eh, buenos días a todos. En primer lugar, eh, well, good morning, everyone. In the first place, I would like to thank uh, CypherCamp and Incive for accepting my presentation, which is going to deal with post exploitation through I bombshell. So we are going to learn how we are going to execute a post exploitation source since an open source tool created here in Spain. And besides that, in, besides learning about PowerShell, I would like to talk about two people, developers that may help in a project, in an open source project. Anyone may collaborate, can modify, can study the code and add new functionalities. And also this is going to be addressed to pen testers that may find this tool useful. This is a description of myself, where I'm working. I'm working in Telefónica, in the 11 Paths Laboratory. I'm also a professor in different Spanish universities. And besides uh, talking at some events such as CyberCamp, I've published a book in Zero Export um, Publishing. Um, Company. So we're going to learn about PowerShell. We are going to talk about different frameworks that have been used for pen testing. And then we are going to learn about iBombshell. For those programmers that may know the code, they might find out how to help in this project by adding new functionalities. We are going to, to analyze the architecture, the different ways of working. And finally, we are going to execute iBombshell in real environments, we are going to create a real scenario, a real network, and we are going to use iBomb Shell. So, in order to do this presentation and the later workshop, I'm going to use a Windows 7 computer, Windows 10 computer, and Kali Linux computer. Windows usually provides 90 uh, days trials. These trials can be activated several times, and they are quite uh, interesting in order to do some testing, especially for those people that you do not usually use uh, Windows. So if you want to try this workshop out and um, do what I'm going to do, you can use these 90 day, day trials of Windows. First question I would like to ask you is, can you do a pen testing without tools? Do you think that can you do a pen testing without tools? And the second question that I want to ask is, could you do a pen testing without tools in Windows, because normally we're using different systems in order to execute these tools. So, well, there is a trick here, because it's not that we are not going to use tools, we are going to use the most powerful tool of uh, Windows, which is PowerShell. So what's PowerShell? When was it created? So PowerShell has been uh, installed by default since Windows Vista and so on. And so this is why I was asking if we could do that uh, pen testing without tools. This is a tool, of course, but it's already installed in the different versions of Windows. We are going to realize that this is a multi platform tool, a Windows tool based on framework. And uh, we will also are, we are also going to learn how to execute PowerShell in Linux and other operating systems. Um, the first version of PowerShell was published, was launched in 2006. Second version was modified and uh, was launched in 2009. In the third version appeared in 2012, fourth version in 2013, with Windows 8.1 and Net Framework 4.0, and version number 5 appeared in 2006, and the sixth version of 
PowerShell became open source, so in the 10th anniversary of Windows 10, they released the code. And this PowerShell code since then is compatible with all operating systems. And in fact, the source code is found in the repository. And this is a project that anyone can clone and modify and adapt to the different environments. And people can even contribute to this PowerShell project. There is also a 7.0 version, which is also open open source. It, it is the, I mean, until 6.0, this version, this um, PowerShell was not open source, but since 6. 0 and 7.0, it is open open source, and 7.0 is under test right now. So, if we have a previous version, it may not work what we are going to do, and if we have a very um, updated version, we may have some functionalities that are not compatible with previous versions. So what frameworks are based on PowerShell? There are several interesting frameworks such as PowerShell Mafia frameworks such as PowerSploit, well, the ones that you can see here on screen. And uh, there are many functionalities related to PowerShell which are related to pen testing at the same time. Another important project that I want to mention is Empire. If you've worked with Empire, you may be familiar with some methods. Also, different frameworks are Nishang, PowerUp, PowerView, and these are used, being used as pen testing tools in PowerShell, as I was saying. So, when we load these, we say that we have 91 modules currently loaded. We have listeners, we have agents, as you can see here. So Empire works as follows. One listener is a listening server, and an eight, one agent is a machine that um, in which some vulnerability has been exploited and that has been connected to that listener. So post-exploitation be, can be done with Empire and with 91 modules that are available. So let's move to iBomb Shell because we are going to see the coding. If you are not familiar with programming, um, don't worry because this is going to be very basic. I just want to show you, to give you an idea of um, the basics of iBomb Shell and then we are going to move to real scenarios. So where does iBomb Shell come from? So the idea of iBomb Shell behind iBomb Shell is offering a pen testing tool available at any time. The different steps that we need to take in order to have iBomb Shell in our equipment um, are the following. We don't have to install anything. Everything is going to be stored in the memory, but we need to take four steps. We have to open the iBomb Shell of Windows. We have to download a prompt to the memory. We are working directly on the memory. We are not uh, touching the disk. After that, we are going to execute the prompt, and we are going to have a new prompt that is going to offer us many functions that are going to be on the cloud and that will be downloaded whenever we need them uh, when doing pen testing. And you could be able to do anything you need with that. So the idea is very simple. Then regarding architecture, how does it work? First thing I want to mention is that everything that we are loading are going, is going to be downloaded in Jihad. And this is great because um, we are going to have an updated prompt at any time if, if we develop a new functionality and we uploaded it to the repository when we can load this iBomb shell to the memory, we are going to have all new functionalities. So from PowerShell, we are going to be in GitHub, and the response is going to be injected. So when we 
Whenever we are closing PowerShell, this mm, uh, script of the new console is going to disappear, and everything. every time we're going to need it, we're going to download it from the Internet. And when we close the PowerShell session, we will lose all these things. So what are we using in iBombshell in order to execute memory stuff? PowerShell has a command called uh, invoke expression. This invoke expression executes commands and stores them in its scope. Here you have an example. If I do I invoke expression in a PowerShell, in PowerShell, this is going to download the script and the function downloaded is going to be stored in a memory and we will be able to use it. This is what we are going to do with iBombshell. In the end, iBombshell is a main function that is going to load in a dynamic way different functions, but we are just loading a function in the memory that we are going to execute later. Here, we, well, I'm not going to start working, start working with um, consoles now, but this is an example. Uh, this string is basically a function which is get processed. If we execute that variable, this is just going to print, print on the screen the variable that we have here but if we use invoke expression, this command is going to be executed. I mean, this is a command that we have stored and invoke expression is going to execute it. So, in order to have our repository on the internet, we also have to use web client downloading, download string. This is going to allow us to download from the internet a series of characters that codifies the function. So, we are going to download a stream of the eHub repository and with invoke, invoke expression, we are going to execute it. So the idea behind that is quite simple. So this is what we are going to see right now in the coding. This is the main function of the iBone shell console because this is, this is where we are going to load the rest of the functions. So whenever we want to have a new functionality, for example, let's imagine that we want, we want to have a scan in order to analyze the ports. When we execute in the prompt of iBone shell, the function that we want to download a port scan, this is what's going to know the function that we are want to download. It's going to download it from the internet and we it's going to load it. And we will be we will be able to use it from that moment. These are the functions that we have right now. And well I'm going to start working from here right now. Can you see properly? I'm going to start using the uh, Visual Studio Text Editor. The console function here, well, I'm, I will explain this later, but I want, okay, let's, let me see if I have something here. Well, it doesn't matter. I was going to open the GitHub repository for you to, to see or for you to try to access the iBombshell repository in GitHub uh, so that you could see this its structure. Well, but the loader fun function is here, is one of the first ones. But the main thing about the console is that this is a function. It is a function that inside is loading other types of functions that are on the cloud. This is the main, the main iBomb shell directory. Here we have readme, license, etc. License is open, sure, open source, as I've mentioned. And the console is what's on the root. It is exactly there on the root. Within that, we have the rest of modules that are on the folder that data. Here we have the rest of the modules. Here in the root, we also have a function point .txt where we have all the functions that we will be able to download. Going back to the presentation, I also want to mention that there are two ways of working. The system is going to be always the same. I bombshell is going to execute in the memory. The first way of working is everywhere. This is a prompt that you don't have. You, you can load it in the memory and you are going to use it whenever you need it. 
So what's the architecture? So we have our computer and we have the GitHub repository. Our uh, computer from iBombshell is going to get the prompt of, of iBombshell. This is going to be loaded in the memory. And that's it. The, after that, we can start playing with the environment. So graphically, what we would load would be that we have the console. That console is going to write down all the function that it's reading. It's going to write it down in function point txt. So whenever we want to implement a new functionality, we're going to put it there. We are going to uh, to keep it there within the fo data folder. There is a classification per folder, so we have a section for bypasses, another section for system, and then we have a series of basic functions which are on the internet, but that as they are so basic, we are going to install them since the beginning. These functions are going to allow us to see the functions that we can download, that we can load, and the functions that are available right now for us to execute. But these two functions need to be by default. These two first basic functions need to be installed by default, because otherwise I'm not going to be able to see the functions that I can load. So the exit, exit, exit function also may be a by default uh, function, because otherwise I won't be able to exit the program. So we're going to do a first demo. Uh, first of all, we're going to see how to uh, load this into a Windows machine. So let's start our equipment with uh, Windows 7, then we will move to Windows 10, and then we will also see, see what problems we may find with Windows 10, because it is true that we have also good news with Windows 10, even though we won't be able to use the most interesting part that for um, post exploitation, there are also good news that we will see later. Bueno, para descargarla. Well, so we're going to move to the main repository of iBombshell, GitHub. Here we are going to see the string that we have to copy and paste. Well, uh, there are some prerequisites here too, but these prerequisites are more oriented towards the second module that we are going to see, which is related to Python. We are talking about the first module here. The other working way is more similar to uh, using C2, and we will see that later. But what we have to do in, here in order to download iBombshell from the repository is this. Um, uh, we are going to do this from the master uh, branch. Um, so I'm going to copy this. We are going to open our PowerShell. We have to be careful here with quotation mark marks because in the readme, I think they added extra quotation marks. Well, before executing this, I would like to show the functions that we have stored here. So, these are the functions that are loaded right now in PowerShell. So, in our memory, in my memory, I have these functions. We don't have any consoles here, as you can see. But now I'm going to download iBombshell. Okay, I couldn't copy it. Okay, now it is. Be careful with quotation marks because they, there is a mistake there. Okay, let's see if I have an internet connection. Okay, so we've just went to GitHub in order to download 
this uh, into the memory. Vale. And now we're going to execute it. Y tenemos este nuevo pro. De and momento, this is the new prompt eh, that no we are going to have. Simplemente cómo se ejecuta I just wanted to show you how to execute de, de everywhere, ¿vale? this everywhere mode. It is as simple as this. And now I'm going to move to vale, something else. Segundo modo de trabajo, el modo the second silent. way of decir, working is silently. Here we can make the most si of the a, functionalities. O sea, una I mean, if we have a function that is in the memory and if we can start interact decimos, interacting bueno, fuera, with it, como, eh, o sea, ese modo de está para I mean, the first way of working, it is thought in order to download tools from Windows without having to install anything. However, in this case, in this second way of working, this is different, and we thought, okay, if in PowerShell I can have a console, why shouldn't we try this console to be controlled remotely? And this is how we, this is why we also need to create a C2, a command and control. This was done in Python, and the way it works is also quite simple. So on the one side we have, I mean, iBombshell is already part of a process. I mean, some vulnerabilities have been exploded and it is integrated already and it is connected to the C2. And it says, I'm a new console and I've been asked to connect to you and the C2 is going to register the IP and that's it. It's not going to say anything else. What's going to happen now is that the machine that has iBombshell Every five seconds is going to start launching requests in order to see if it has to do anything. So every time we are generating a new function, C2 is going to keep a file that is going to be consulted by that infected machine that is called Warrior. So as Empire had its, its own name for machines here, we've called this computer warrior. This is going to be a warrior. The warrior is going to be asking continuously, do I have to do something? Do I have to do something? Whenever it has to do something, it's going to receive that message and the, it's, it is going to execute in memory what it has to do and it's going to give the results back. So the system is quite simple too. And what's the architecture of this way of working? Well, we have the prompt executed in a memory process. We have a session that has been created and that needs to be monitored because maybe at some point the machine that's connected stops working, so we need to establish, to reestablish that session. And there may be also different computers. We may have different computers, some of them with privileges, some of them without privileges. And this is uh, divided in different sessions that we may be able to control. And we may choose to which session we want to send the commands. This is also classified per folders, but instead of having the code in, in PowerShell, as before, these are classes done in Python. So within Python programming, we have a PowerShell function. This PowerShell function is a string. That string is going to be downloaded into the memory. It's going to inject that inject in the memory that way. So there are two Python files which are very important, two modules that are, that are very important. The first one is the listener. We are going to try to break into that server that is going to send the connections from remote machines. And then we, if we want to, we can create new warriors if we want to inject new warriors in that machine. So how are we going to connect to the C2? So here in this case, I'm going to use Kali, but you can use any other system that you may have. But this is the system that I'm going to use in order to break into the server that's going to receive the connections. So first, I'm going to prepare it. So this has been downloaded um, from the repository. 
This is what we're going to see in our repository. So here we have a folder called iBombshell C2. So here we can see how everything is divided into parts and how the Everywhere module is different from the rest of the modules. So both of them work based on memory, but while uh, Everywhere module keeps all functions in the data folder, the, mo the C2 that is in iBombshell C2 folder is completely separate. So if I click here on C2, I have like a new different Py Python project, which is command and control. Once the prerequisites uh, ha has have been installed, we can execute iBombshell in order to obtain the shield. And here I would have to call the listener. Well, this, we will see this later when we start creating modules. So now that we have the listener, we are going to go to the Windows computer. And what we are going to do is to execute the console in order to uh, by um, adding the silently mode. This is a flag that is going to indicate that we want to connect remotely. And I'm, well, I haven't configured the interface. Well, okay, I want to do this and in order for it to find it, but if, if everything is working fine, the Kali e machine is 10.0.0.3 and Windows machine is 10.0.0.7. So, well, right now we are executing this since the PowerShell that has been installed, but later in the real demonstration, I will inject this console with an exploitation process, with an exploit process. Vamos a ver si llega. 10.003. No, no, todo está mal. Ok, it's not working. Vale, le tenemos que indicar el puerto al que nos vamos. We have to. Uh, to define the port to which we have we want to connect. Here it is. We've just done a remote uh, connection. We've configured the listener. And this is how we're going to connect. So what we're going to do, the command that you've seen, console silently, uh, that is related to an IP, is what we are going to inject. So the, the exploit process is the part that we will inject later. So these are the different no, ways of working. I think that they are completely different. We have the everywhere mode and the silently mode, which are very different, as you have seen. Open source. Open source. Once again, how are we going to be able to collaborate with the project? If you are good at writing in PowerShell or Python, if you want to study the code, if you want to modify modified and do an improved version, you can do it. I mean, there are people that have collaborated. They are, there's a C2 uh, written in graphic. I think and there was a someone that did a graphic interface in order to control C2, for example. This was a 14-year-old uh, uh, young guy that liked programming and decided to do that. So if you also like programming and you want to extend the functionality of the project, you can do it. iBombshell is a tool that's quite under development. I mean, it is like a beta version, it's not a final version, but it's true that we find people that have used PowerShell in order to do pen testing. We've seen several presentations about that, and I think this is great, because we are starting to develop the tool, and I mean, and we want people to use it, and we want, of course, people to collaborate so that this grows. So some of the characteristics, PowerShell, Python 3.6, 3.6, 
GN, you license Docker. If you want to use Docker, we've done an image that you can use in order to download PowerShell and the Python um, variables in order for you to play in with the two modes from Docker. And then we also have the papers. We, ha we also have papers in which there are many more details about um, my presentation today. If you have any questions, you can go to the papers section. The tool, of course, has uh, evolved since the papers, but the core and the functionality is well explained there. So how are we going to create modules? First of all, if we're going to create it for the everywhere mode or shaley. If we create modules for PowerShell, as you're going to see, I'm going to show you some of the functions. We're not still using this structure, but when we use the help command, these first lines that you see here can get get us a description of what we're going to do. So when executing the help module, we're going to get this information. Otherwise, if you do a functionality on PowerShell, you download it and you don't know how to use it, then here you have a description, a set synopsis, what parameters you need to enter, and when you execute the help command, uh, it will help you to understand what what is going on. But before that, let's see the code of a certain function. This is a function that I downloaded from the internet. It is not still implemented on PowerShell, but we will see later there is a function in order to download external PowerShell functions in addition to those which are gathered at iBombshell um, repository. This function's name is GetSystemInfo, which offers you a brief description of the system you're executing. It is divided into several functions because when I execute these in PowerShells, it will be executed at system information, even if the, the name of the file is get system info. The main function's name is get system information. This one, the PS1, has several functions which will be called when the main function is called. And all of them have these tags in order to have parameters, synopsis, description, and so on. So if we should get system, it says main function. It has its synopsis, description, how it is used, and then you will be able to use it. If I'm not wrong, I think I had it over here. I had it on the Kali virtual machine. So what I am going to do in line with the following demonstration is to have iBombshell on your own server. I'm going to download it through the server. Let's imagine that now we're saying that iBombshell is in GitHub, and that's the philosophy. The idea is to be able to download it at any time from GitHub if you have access to internet. Let's imagine we are in an internal network, and there are only a few computers within that network, but we do not have GitHub. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to assign uh, to do my demonstration in order to lift this server and then we will be able to play with our own server. I'm not going to download it from GitHub as I did in my first demonstration. What I'm going to do is to have it on my own server. If I do some, if I make some changes, everything will be in my virtual machine. 
So, what are we going to do? First of all, we are going to download the iBombshell code in the server that we select. I'm going to use Kali Machine in order to do it here. Then we're going to do the invoke expression to call the part of the memory, and it is going to be launched here in our repository. So what are we going to modify? If we review the console code, we can take a look at a code revision of a normal console. Here you have some parameters. It can be used in proxy. We have the assignment mode. So there will be a condition which says if this is here, you're going to execute it in another way. Here you, fa you have the loader function through which you are going to receive the function that you want to download, and this is the one that will load that function. In order to do so, it recurs to a make request, so there is a function that makes the request, and the request will send us a string in order to inject it in the memory. Here we have several functions, such as the read functions function, there is another one in order to save in the register, and here it's the important part. Where are we going to point at? Where I am going to download it from? We need to do some modifications. I wish that in the future we will be able to uh, modify it and set it up without losing the main nature of iBombshell. I'm not paying for a server. I'm downloaded in directly. We need to redirect because everything we write has to be redirected. If we have the silently mode, it is going to execute everything here. Otherwise, if it's not silently mode, it will go on the other side. So here, it's where we're going to point at. I have modified it already here. Let's see if it's over here. Yeah, here it is. So I'm lifting it to my own machine, which is set up with a 10.0.0.3 with the port number 8000. Yeah. So, as I was saying, we lift our server on this machine. The, is, the easiest and fastest way to do it is that I could use an Apache, but there is another easier way, which is Python. When I launch the Python with the mode simple HTTP server, it, because it has left it a server, and if I access the direction 10.0.0.3, where the server has been lifted, we'll see the root of where I am. So I am within iBone shell part. Okay, so here we have our server. Everything's right over here. And the Windows machine, the only thing I'm going to do here this is the listener, but I'm going to point at you don't need to you need to make a distinguish between the listener which is in port 8080 and the repository which is in port 8000 here I have the connection notice that we were pointing at github to load this memory part Now, 
Vale, y ahora le hemos cargado. And now we have loaded it from our virtual machine from the 10003. Vale, pues esto sería como eh, levantamos el... So that's how you lift a iBone shell on our own server. As you have seen, it's quite easy to do. You just have to do a few steps to have our own iBone shell in our Kali machine, which is the server that I just created. Now we could make some changes on this Kali machine, which will be reflected on that PowerShell. Y por último también me queda Finally, la, vale, entendiendo los módulos eh, las formas de trabajo. Eh, si hemos let's talk about modules and ways of working. If we have, uh, if we have looked at functions on iBomb shell, let's see how those functions work here. As I was saying, within iBomb shell repository, you have iBomb shell C2, which is Python's part. If you look at here, you have several functions. We can review some of them. First of all, you have a template dot pi, which tells you how to implement a second module from the C2. This is a custom module object that depends on module, and we have all the information about it in order to show what that module does. And we also have the options we will need. We will always need it to be pointed at a warrior. One of our machines under C2 control is to know where we're going to send our functions. And then we have the variable, variables that we want to select. Maybe we want to execute a command, so we would need a way to reset, a co to send a command, and we will do this here. We have a list with three values, a initial value, if we want to give it one. We see it in the listener mode. If we lift the listener mode, it says that you will be redirected to the port 8080 unless it specified the opposite. Then we have a description. And finally, you have the information of whether it is required or not. If it is required, you cannot launch this module without activating this uh, option. If you so you need this option is uh, required and then it needs to uh, be activated. Then you have the information of the module, then you have the room method, which is a PowerShell function, but the project is from Python, and this string is belong the PowerShell function installed in our memory. The first thing you need to do is to define the function, but you need to call it. And in order to do so, well, this file is going to look for our warrior. If our warrior executes this function on the memory, it, you need to execute it, and then you have to execute this boom function. So boom minus m because we had a message that indicated true. So at least we need to add it here. This is going to generate a file which is going to be called by the warrior and it is going to be downloaded. As you see, it is quite easy to create modules. My Python modules are quite easy. The most difficult part is the iBob shell part because it is what's going to be executed. So I think this is quite easy. You need to focus mainly on PowerShell scripts. If, for example, we open the listener, 
¿vale? El de listener. Si os fijáis, este es el que es un poco diferente porque aquí estamos the different one because we're lifting a server even if it is listener we're lifting a server where warriors are going to make consultations on in order to see if they contain something. So it is a bit different from the others. If we open another one, like this one, we see that we also have the function. Maybe it is a more it is more complex than the template, but you have the room. Well, we'll start from the beginning. We have the definition of the module, its requirements and so on, and then we have the room module with the PowerShell function, which is verifying some conditions in order to enter some things or other things. Then the PowerShell function and to call memory. Okay, now we're going to see a real scenario. Now we know the tool, we know how to create modules, we know the two ways of working, we have tried them only on the surface, but we're going to try them now in a real environment. This is the scenario we're going to follow. We have the Kali machine where we have the repository which is going to be pointed there and we have the listener. Then we have the Windows 7 machine and the Windows 10 machine. The first demonstrations we're going to do are the following. Only with Windows 7 machine and to know the everywhere mode. Then we're going to have the 10.0.0.1 with the listener listener and our idea is going to send it from this machine to the Windows 7 machine and finally to pass it from Windows 7 to Windows 10, everything through iBombshell. So let's go for it. And before this one turns off, I'm going to reset it manually, if it allows me to do so. Because since they have 90 days trial, they can reset themselves, and I don't want it to happen in the middle of the demonstration. I'm going to wait a little bit in f before starting Windows 10. Okay, machines are connected within an internal network. All of them are connected to each other. Windows 7, Windows 10, and Kali. What I have in Kali, we have the listener, which was executing, but I'm going to stop it because the Windows 7 machine, if we turn it on, it will have turned this one off. It says it's dead. It detects it as dead. Every time you leave the C2 mode, the files are dead. Because in the end, it is always making consultations on whether there are or not any files. And we're going to lift it on our own repository. Okay, let's move on to PowerShell now. I will leave this open for later. And we're going to download the Everywhere mode. If we want it, if you want to work on Everywhere mode, Let's see if it allows me to do so. Okay, let's see. Since we have seen everything, we're going to focus on the tool itself. What can we do with iBombshell in everywhere mode? Let's do a small demonstration. If you don't have the manual of instructions to read it, 
it can be actually a bit intuitive. It says you can use show commas in order to see what commands are available to be downloaded, and then you have the show function in order to see what we can execute because we have downloaded it already. We have all these available. I am going to start loading a basic function, uh, for example, the help function. How can I download the uh, functions? Just clicking on, just copying the name of it. In the case of help, it is not in any subfolder, in any category. So function loaded. So the following that we can load in order to scan ports is here. In scanner TCP scan, there is a function that analyzes ports. So let's copy it. How can I load functions? Just type in their name. And how can I execute them now? Just invoking them. But I may not know how to use these modules, so then I execute the help function, and here I have the information of the module. This is a beta version, so there are some things that have not been yet implemented. We want to uh, offer instruction information for people to know how to use it, and here we have the basic syntax of this function. As you have seen, I have lifted the 8080, the 8000 port in the Kali machine. So I am going to execute TCP scanned from a range only, not to, not for it to take it long. So I'm going to invoke TCP scanned with IP 10.0.0.3, and let's specify a range uh, 7999 to 80001. So this starts scanning, and there it is a port scanning in memory. You don't need an N map in order to scan ports. If everything is destroyed, somebody may think, isn't, isn't there a, any possibility to be able to save what we have in the memory? For example, I do a lot of audits, and I usually start with a TCS, TCP scan. Can I already save those functions in order not to download them all the time in memory? Yes, we have the save function. Look look at what it's doing. It is directing to the registry. It is saving all the scripts that we have downloaded here. In this case, only help function and TCP scan function. It has in the current user, it has created an entry line by line to recover it later. Let's go to the registry. As you see, I should have shown you this earlier, but if you execute this on your computer, you won't have it. It has saved the functions. I have downloaded the help and TCP functions and look at what it does. It is storing the function in registry code so that when we open iBombshell, the first thing we're going to do is to look at the registry. If there is something on the registry, it is going to load that content. So if everything works fine, I am going yeah, I am going to leave here to quit, and I am going to launch the console. Usually this function is not loaded, but when I launch it, it is going to make a consultation on the registry in order to download our functions. 
Let's see, this usually takes longer because it has to recover from the registry. Let's see if it loads the functions. Otherwise, I will download it again. Yes, that's what I'm going to do, because it's a bit slow. Let's see if it loads it. Yes, we see them here. If we didn't have these functions in the beginning, since now I have copied them, I have them available for me to execute them. But maybe we do not have access to, in to Internet. In iGOMSHELL repository, there is a part that invokes PowerShell that needs to upload the console mode from the registry. That's what you would need to do if you don't have access to the Internet, and then you could keep on working. Another function I had mentioned was the possibility to download external functions. Uh, I'm going to see the commands. Yeah, and it is this one the loader text to load external functions. Since I am pointing at the normal server now, this may not work because all the references are pointing at the GitHub. Let's see if it works. We have a small catalog as a sample catalog because here we're pointing at Empire projects. We have also PowerShell Mafia, the Power Exploit that has many functionalities. And we have decided to include some of them here. I can't open anymore. Let's see if it works. And every time you have a problem, you can call the help function. So it says we have two possibilities with the loader, loader X to execute the catalog where we have included some proposals or the or the URL, which is not finished yet. Let's see if I did it right. Here we have it. Yeah, it has loaded it. Or maybe not. I think I... Yeah, I was executing help function. Let's see if it connects it to the other machine. Yes, it's loaded. So here we would see the invoke of the DLL injection all the functions on PowerShell, which are on all the repository, can be loaded. So we can provide support to people who have their own functions in order to use them. So we have already done this. Let's move on to Ex, the uh, ex post exploitation part. We're going to start a meta exploit console, and what we're going to do is the machine, the Windows 7 machine, has a vulnerable application. I let's imagine we have already done a search for vulnerabilities. So in that exploitation process, I'm going to inject. Uh, DLL from the remote I, I bombshell. 
Bueno, lo primero es... So first thing to do, you may be wondering, how can I create a DLL from iBombshell? Let's launch again the panel. Let's launch, launch the listener. This is the uh, commands that we can execute. With load, we're going to load modules. With show, we're going to see the information, the description, the authorship, and the fields. At some points, you will see which of them are required and they have to be activated. As you see, this is the setting it has, and with room, we launch it. So the listener module is ready at the 8080 port. The next module I'm going to launch, here you can see the C2 sections. So there is one module for bypass, another one for credentials, execution, files, so modules for OS X, persistence, we're going to see some of them. Here is the generate module. Within this module, we have all these. So we could generate in a very easy way for a macro, for the CBD, for rubber ducky. So for example, if I execute the rubber ducky, in this case, this is a required field, so I have to set IP and write the direction 10.0.0.3. In this port, we have a default value, and here, op optionally, we can decide whether we want to save the code in a file. If we want to generate the file and save it into the rubber ducky. And here with room, it is offering me the information that I just sent it. So we are going to use the one that says generate DLL. So in this case, we want the IP to connect to us, and we are going to keep it somewhere in our system. Let's keep it here, for example, root cybercamp dot dll. So here, I should be able to see it. Then I'm going to execute it, because I'm, if I don't execute it, I'm just going to be establishing the variables. I have to execute it. Now we have generated our DLL, and we are going to use it. So as I was saying, we are going to launch Metasploit, and as we already know that this machine has already a vulnerability, we are going to exploit it and we are going to connect to our listener through the DLL. The Windows 7 machine, well, I'm going to exit this. La tengo preparada con un par de programas vulnerables, ¿vale? Podría elegir o bien un FTP, como es con la Miolta. So the Windows 7 machine has been prepared with a couple of vulnerabilities. In this case, this application... Okay, this is open right now. I'm going to launch it again. Okay, so this trial version... Just lasts for 30 minutes, which is enough for this example. So, well, this is a web server. This is an application with a web server that once had a vulnerability. And I'm going to use that vulnerability. Well, I'm not going to explain Metasploit because this is just the tool that we are going to use to explode the, the vulnerability. 
but you can use rubber ducky wherever you want to. This is just an example that we are doing through DLL. All these tools, all these pen testing tools and vulnerable exploit tools usually have their own problem, and with Ibom Shell it works <coughs> similarly to. So this is the way of setting variables. Well, I don't know if you can see it very well, but one of the requirements here is the machine that we are going to attack or where we want to exploit that vulnerability. In this case, Windows 7, so 007. So what are we going to do once this vulnerability is exploded? We want, if we can use a meterpreter if we want to get a meterpreter console, but in this case, we're going to use our DLL. So DLL inject. If we show the options right now, we're going to see that the payload options are defining our DLL. As we've created one, we're going to write it down, set DLL, root cybercamp, dot DLL. So let's see if I've set it, it right. Okay, I'm going to launch it to see if it works. The listener is somewhere here. Well, I'm going to launch it again. Okay, let's try again. Some something failed. I'm going to. Okay, let's wait for a minute. Okay, because if the exploit process is working fine and the module is working fine, it should work. Okay, it closed. Let's let's try again. Zero zero seven. Okay, I think now it should work. Okay, I'm going to try something else. Okay, I forgot to do something which is generating the DLL. So something I forgot here is that my system is 32 bits and the requirements is 64 bits, but I have a DLL that I've generated and I'm going to change it. I'm going to replace it. This one is for 32 bits. Okay, let's see if now it works with this one. Vamos a ver ahora. 
Esta le gusta, la de, la de 30 y... Ok, vale, let's see if... No, ok, vale, now it's de, working. De it, it was a problem with the, 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 the elevation. So now I have a, war, a warrior available. Well, I'm going to launch it manually, I think, because this symbol here is uh, causing a problem. I mean, I don't want to connect with uh, privileges, because later we are going to do a bypass in order to obtain privileges uh, from iBomb Shell, but I already have some privileges because I've launched the, the process that way. I'm going to try to do it with Konica Minolta. Okay, now let's use a different one. Okay, so this is another application which is vulnerable. I'm going to set the payload of Windows, DLL. Okay, so we've already defined the host, the DLL. So this is the one that may work. Let's see if the Konica Minolta, which is somewhere here, is going to send uh, to to give us a shell without privileges okay we have the listener here we have the dll let's see if this program works let's see okay now now it's done so before we had a life and a star this is in order to identify that we have privileges but in order to work in a more real environment we want to start exploiting a vulnerability in a system that doesn't have privileges because that's, that's the fun part. We have to get that privileges afterwards. So if I want to do any process that requires admin uh, privileges such as um, uh, achieving passwords, I cannot do it. So this is why I want to go from here to a machine with privileges. If, the, if we are lucky enough to find a process with privileges and we get back these privileges, then part of the work would have been done already. It would be more simple. So the warrior command allows us to do different things with warriors, such as killing, listing, or renaming. So uh, as it may be a little bit confusing, we're, I'm going to change names. And this one is going to be called, for example, Windows 7. So then we are going to do a bypass, a UAC bypass. What's that exactly? When we try to launch an application or when we are launching an application that needs privileges, this Windows pop up, pops up. And with a UAC bypass, we can execute a process with privileges without having this window popping up. So this is what we want to get. This, that's our objective. We want to execute with uh, privileges, skipping the UAC. This is a control measure. It's, it means user account control of Windows. And uh, it's been working for a long time. When we were having Windows Vista, and Windows Vista, this was popping up every now and then. And uh, it was quite tiring for the users having this window all the time, but in Windows 7, they decreased a little bit the level of intrusion. So when is a UAC bypass going to work? It's not always going to work. We need to meet certain requirements. For example, the user that's executing the processes in the machine should belong to the admin team. 
It, it doesn't have to be the main admin, but it should be part of the admin team. And also the UIC configuration must be by default, because this has certain levels. If we want to to be um, to have this window popping up all the time we ha we may set things up in order to have this so certain requirements must be uh, met yes, because the, in the end this is the window that we want to skip the screen we want to scream uh, Windows has had many UAC bypasses throughout his, his, its history and Windows doesn't even consider it it as a vulnerability sometimes just it's just a I use characteristic there are many ways of skipping that screen that window sometimes there is a process that may look for a DLL in order to execute it and if it doesn't exist it's going to use the DLL library the main DLL library people that found this out for example there are some processes of Windows that are executed with privileges all the time. So the bypass tries to get to, to get in the middle of these processes that use privileges in order to uh, target the code that we want to, to address. So this looks uh, a DLL in the registry, and uh, it would help us do the bypass. So we are going to execute this in a process with privileges. For example, if we have here, for example, here we have the IBOM shell connection process. And this machine without privileges needs to replicate the UAC bypass in order to get our, our warrior back. When we do our UAC bypass, we are going to execute coding. It may be just a writing unit C, but if we don't have the permit to write in C, we are not going to be able to do so. But what we are going to do is injecting a command that gives us back directly a, another warrior. And in order to do so, I'm going to use the bypasses, UAC bypass. Here we have several bypasses, and the one that is working in my environment is this one. So what do I need to do? I need to introduce the warrior that's going to execute this, and then optionally I can uh, give an instruction. If we don't give an instruction, it's not going to do anything. So Windows 7 plus the instruction. I think it is somewhere here because it's kind of long. I'm going to explain to you what it does. So when we say we want to execute an instruction, I mean, we normally say I want you to give back another IBOM shell with PowerShell. I mean, I'm going to bring up a PowerShell process in order to inject it back. If we use PowerShell.exe, it's not going to be found. So we need to write down the pathway, the exact pa pathway. Windows PowerShell, um, well, all the, um, the pathway. And then we're going to execute a command. This is why we have here minus C. And minus C involves downloading what we've seen in this uh, workshop. It's going to go to GitHub, or our normal repository is going to download, and it's going to be to execute a return in a silently mode. So let's see if this works. The Windows machine is not uh, noticing this because there are no alerts popping up. So here we see that we have another warrior which has privileges. This is what we are looking for before we got the privileges because the process was being executed in a uh, from a high level. So here we can see the star. So the star means that that um, session has privileges. If not, it doesn't have privileges. And now we're going to rename these two. So I'm going to rename all these things so that we can identify them better. This is going to be 
win those seven leagues. <coughs> so, okay, I've changed the names here. And now I'm going to start bringing up all the machines. Now we are playing with Kali with Windows 7. Let's introduce another agent in the game. We are going to introduce a machine that uses Windows 10. But we bring it up. We're going to do something else. Okay, let's see in which part of the demonstration we are. Okay, that's the scenario. We've done fingerprinting to saving to the L injection to. So credential uh, petition. Okay, let's play a little bit with this. So we're going to do a lateral movement in order to get to the Windows 10 machine. We need to know the admin password in order to do so. So the admin password normally is the same for all the computers in the same networks in order to be able to, be able to to manage them remotely. So we may use that in order to achieve the credentials. That's right, this is what we're going to do now. However, we can do something else which seems silly, but visually I'm sure that you're going to like. If I have here a machine with Windows 7, we have a module here that has been called Fishy. I'm not going to explain what phishing is, but it's like uh, faking something. So let's see the options that we have. Who's going to bring this up? Okay, Surf Warrior. We're going to bring it up with our normal Windows 7 uh, system. And here it says title, name, and domain. We have some information by default, but are you, can you imagine what I'm going to do? Okay, let's set title here. Okay, so this is it. If you cannot get passwords from the user, ask for them. What would you do if you see the ad screen? Okay, you start writing. This is my username and this is my password. So, if the user sees that screen, the user is going to fill it in and that's it. If I cannot, if I don't have the credentials, I'm going to try to ask the credentials to the machine. Now we're going to get the hashes from that machine, so I have privileges, and now I want to get the credentials. So we're, we, here we are going to use the power down um, function, which is something that we have in the memory and that is going to allow to get the hashes. As everything is quite well developed, we just have to generate modules, configure them, and launch them. And launch them. If I decide to launch the Windows 7 normal warrior, it's going to say that it doesn't have the privileges to do what we want to do. That function doesn't have admin privileges, but this is why I'm, I have I, I've um, done the bypass. Uh, um, update in order to get this type of privileges. And here we can see all the passwords, all the hashes. As I've said before, in an organization, we all have the same admin password so that the general admin can manage, administrate all the machines remotely. This is going to be the result. So we're going to use pass the hash. So as machines are managed in the same network, we are going to use the admin password in order to move from the Windows 7 machine to the Windows 7 machine. Let's see if we have it here already, if the Windows 10 machine has been already brought up. Okay, so here we have our Windows 10 machine. And we are going to use SMBEXET. 
So what's here? So here we are going to decide who's going to initiate that lateral movement, the warrior that's going to execute that. In this case, Windows 7 machine is going to do that. The target is the remote IP, the Windows 10 machine to, towards we want to move to. And then we have the admin hash that we need in order for this uh, lateral movement to uh, to happen. So the target is 10.0.0.10. This is my Windows 10 machine, or at least it should be. I'm going to check it. Okay, so yes, it, it is 10.0.0.10. I'm going to get the hash from up here. Set hash. And here, the command is also very important. But if we just want to check that we've done the hash, we can do a writing in C and in order to show that this is it. But we want to bring up another bombshell and another Windows 10 that we want to include here. So we are going to launch again what we what we had before. So here you have set command. So we are doing the same thing as we cannot execute PowerShell. We're going to execute it like that. And if it works, let's see if it works. If it works, we're going to launch it. The Windows 7 machine is going to receive an instruction, is going to execute it, and the Windows 10 machine, I mean, and we will be able to break into the Windows 10 machine from the Windows 7 machine. So we've achieved a Windows 10 to, to, to get into a Windows 10 session and with privileges, and we have plenty of time, I'm going to do the same thing, but doing a UAC bypass in Windows 10. First, I will have to bring up a normal session, but well, let's finish with this process first, because we can do more things here. So we have the three machines here, they are all alive. If one of them is kind of weak, we will see it graphically. I'm, already, I'm going to rename these two. This is Windows 10 with privileges. Okay, so we're inside the Windows 10 machine. So what else can we do now that we have privileges in this process? Well, I mean, Windows 10 now has AMSI, and I told you that there is something good about Windows 10 and iBOM Shell. Because currently, Windows is already detecting iBOM shell as a malware, and it doesn't let you uh, store it in the memory. With Windows 7, it, it works fine, but Microsoft has uh, is now aware of uh, iBOM shell and is protecting memory from that. And how does it know how a malicious process is being stored in the memory? Because, I mean, with an antivirus, you can analyze the disk in order to see what's going on, but when we are working at the memory, at the memory level, uh, that option didn't exist. So this is why this is working, what we are doing right now. But now, Windows 10 is very fine in the memory too. And what does it mean? So nowadays, it it uh, realizes that bombshell is, is there and uh, alerts you. If we are using an old Windows version, we could disable the malware, for example, the power dump or the mimic act have already detected that. And, but uh, uh, this is a new tool, this is not going to be detected. In this case, with iBOM Shell, we can bypass the AMC of Windows. So when the AMC is trying to check if there's something weird in the memory, Windows Defender is going to be alerted. But with the patch, what we're going to do is patching it so that it is not executed. 
bypass the AMC. So we are going to move to the AMC bypass. Y simplemente nos pide, nos pide el warrior, ¿vale? And este okay, the warrior is going to be requested. This is Windows 10. So in this case, we are not going to be able to see anything. I mean, we are going to get back a patch. But now we are going to bring it up in order to see what happens in PowerShell so that you can see that this executed in PowerShell and it includes a patch so that the AMC is not executed. And if we've disabled, I mean, when we do an AMC bypass, now it is patched. The last thing that we can do here with, bomb, with iBombshell is um, disabling the, win the Windows antivirus. So here we have a monitor. We are going to write down Defender real time. Here we just have to, uh, to type the warrior with where it is located. Okay, this is Windows 10p, and we want to say we want this to be enabled or disabled. We want we are going to say that we want the antivirus to be disabled, and from now, I mean we've patched the AMC of the Windows 10. We've done the AMC bypass and we've disabled the antivirus. So now we we can do whatever we want to. So we're going to look the AMC into detail. Let's kill warriors. Now maybe it's not necessary. And let's do the final part, which is do a bypass to Windows 10, because now Windows 10 was used as an administrator. But let's try to do a bypass now. I'm gonna do it directly here. So first thing to do is to download it. So for that, I have to copy it, and I'm going to connect manually. So everything that I execute will appear here on the console. I'm executing it manually and remember the parameters silently, silently and Yuri console in the 10.003 port 8080. So here we have one of them. And on our panel, we have four machines, Windows 7 with our privileges, Windows 7 with privileges, Windows 10 with privileges, and the new one. I'm going to rename it and call it Wind 10 to know which one it is. So now we have here all of them. So the first thing, we're going to do a bypass from UAC, and when we apply AMC, well, if we want to do a bypass that we want to detect, we would have to need to patch the AMC in order to execute the uh, UAC. So let's load the uh, module of bypasses from the AMC. In this case, it would be Windows 10. So here it should appear something. It says the buffer scanner from AMC has been parted. patched. And now we're going to do a bypass. UAC. What this is going to do, this is the case I was mentioning earlier. It is consulting within the registry if it is pointing at uh, DLL, and we need to uh, come in first. We need to inject DLL in Windows environment. It requires warrior, IP, and port. So warrior is normal Windows 10, and we want to connect to 10.003. 
that's the IP address, and we want the port 8080. So let's see if it does something, because this should launch a new PowerShell Windows 10 process with elevated privileges. As you see, the list is extending. Now we have Windows 7 and Windows 7 with privileges, Windows 10 and Windows 10 with privileges, and the new one that was generated through the bypass. And I'm going to rename it as Window 10 Privileges 2. In the same way, we could do what we have already done. As we as earlier we did the lateral movement from Windows 7 to Windows 10, it was generated with privileges. But if the if we didn't have privileges, we would start with the machine Windows 10. So a process without privileges that we need to upgrade, and from there to patch. Uh, and so on. So finally, the last demonstration was to pass the hash through lateral movement. So here is the end of my workshop. I think we have some time for questions, so please feel free to to ask. Bueno, muchas gracias, Álvaro, por tu presentación. Thank you for your presentation, Alvaro. I wanted to ask you if you're going to introduce an obfuscation method between the uh, infected client and the UC2. Are you going to implement uh, an op obfuscation method in other versions? to analyze communications. Yeah, that would be quite interesting, actually. Requests are made through HTTP. The connection could be made through HTTPS, but now it is done through HTTP, but with encrypted content. The project is open source, so anyone who dares and who understands about this, I encourage you to do it in order to make the project improve. Any other questions? Good morning, Alvaro. Congratulations on your presentation. Why do you use Docker? What is it used for? Do you know how Docker works, right? Yes, but I don't know why the tool has Docker. Well, we took an uh, image of Docker in case you want to lift the C2 from Docker, or if you want to launch the everywhere mode from Docker, just in case you have that image. Any other questions? Okay, no further questions then. In that case, let's leave it here and thank you very much for your attention.